it's uh, two o'clock, so we'll make a start. Um, I'm expecting some more people to come, but we'll let them come in as they arrive. Uh, thank you so much for attending uh, today's um, MBAI professionals event. Um, what I wanted to do uh, today is to um, invite a guest speaker who was able to talk to you about LinkedIn and networking. Um, you know, these are all different tools that we can use to help us find jobs, especially when we, you know, might be facing difficulties getting the full-time job or getting the, um, you know, permanent job that uh, you might be applying for when you're finishing. Um, and especially because as international students, you may face the barrier of um, the permanent residency requirement or the um, uh, citizenship requirement. So I guess about if we can network, then maybe we can kind of, you know, get our jobs through the back door, so to speak. Um, so you, most of you would know me, Dr. Jane Menzies. Um, I've been your course director for about uh, a year and a half, nearly two years. So since the middle of, uh, 2017 um, and as you might know I'll be going on parental leave uh, from Monday onwards um, and so we'll be having an, uh, another course director um, his name is Dr Joe Jang and he's just over here so um, did you want to say anything Joe? Um, no really, <laughs> so, um, but I will um, help Jane next year and be the uh, uh, so if you have any questions that you would like to see the course, I mean, please feel free to uh, talk to me and send me an email or just make an appointment to read that course. And perhaps in, um, in the next year, and we will also have a, a couple of activities like this uh, to help you build your career uh, skills and to understand um, Australian career market and perhaps also uh, international career market. So that, um, so. Okay, thank you very much, Joe. Um, okay, so we are just. Okay, so I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for today, uh, which is uh, Sue Elson. Uh, and I've known Sue probably for the last 10 to 15 years, I would say. <laughs> a long time. <laughs> um, and I uh, would have met Sue, and I was just trying to think, how did I meet Sue? Um, through the Australian Human Resources Institute Special Interest Group in International Human Resource Management, uh, because that's my sort of research area, academic area. Um, and as a young PhD student and also as an academic, I used to go to a lot of their events um, and just networking, just meeting people. And, um, and of course, as we move into the digital age and the digital age of networking, um, have been uh, connected with Sue over LinkedIn for a number of years as well. Uh, and I noticed that Sue was holding a number of events at different universities about how to use LinkedIn for your careers and for networking. Um, and hence um, my invite of Sue to come and speak to you today. Okay, so Sue has a very long list of um, achievements <laughs> and uh, things that she's involved with. Uh, and that's actually like in your little handout. I think it's on page six, or page four. Um, so you can get acquainted with Sue's um, uh, professional background through there. Uh, and you can see the types of things that she's done over her uh, long career uh, from uh, working in consultancy, um, working at Westpac, etc., cetera, um, to being <coughs> her, I guess, her own boss mm -hmm. and uh, being a career consultant. Um, Sue also has a number of books as well, which she's um, got presented up here. So um, without any further ado, I would like to introduce Sue to talk to you today. Um, can you hear us okay? Or would you like us to put the mic on? That's pretty uh, yeah. uh, Mic or not? Uh, no, yeah, 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 okay, mic. Right. Jane and thank you 
Dr. Jan as well. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. This is my second visit to Deakin. I did a presentation for the Centre for Supply Chain and Logistics down the other end of the hall uh, last year. So really pleased to be here. Um, this is the first time I've combined both LinkedIn and networking in a comprehensive seminar. So I'm going to get you up and active because I know it's after lunch and chocolate cake is very good, but it's not as good as moving. And uh, you'll notice on my LinkedIn profile that one of the things I love to do is dance. So just be thankful I'm not making you all dance this afternoon because I look pretty bad when I'm dancing, but it's still a lot of fun. So um, Jane has taken my notes. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Which one am I taking? Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Um, so as it um, indicates on the handout there, obviously what I'd like to help you with is, is really understanding LinkedIn, but also how to network both online and offline. And there's a lot of really interesting principles that a lot of people are not aware about uh, when they're studying about how to network. And I remember the first training session I ever ran, I was so nervous I ate chocolate before I did it and then I couldn't speak. And so that's, I know how nerve wracking it is to, to be in front of a crowd for the first time. But after you've had lots of practice, you get very good at it. And there's two topics that are really popular to talk about in Melbourne. Does anybody know what those two topics are? The weather, yes, excellent. What's the other topic? Football. Who barracks for Collingwood? Anybody? Now that's good. Yes, because I say to people you should not barrack for Collingwood because people, it's black and white the colours and people either love you or hate you. So there's no Collingwood supporters, we're all in good company uh, today. So what I'm going to do is, as I said, I've had lots of practice teaching all sorts of different things and I'd like you to think about eight, six to eight words that describe your skills. So if I'm looking for you, I'm the decision maker in a company and I'm searching for you online, and what would the words I would type in to my search query to find you? And two of those words are not seeking opportunities. Nobody is looking for someone who is seeking opportunities. We're looking for somebody with skills. So on the top of page five, I'd like you to write down six or eight words that you think people would look for if they were looking for your skills. And then after you've done that, I'm going to get you to find someone else in the room and you're going to give your hand out to that person and they're going to, without any clues from you, try and describe what you do. And then you'll have to do it for the other person. So the first step, write down the six or eight words and then the second step, go and talk to somebody else and let them tell you what they think it is you do. But they're only allowed to look at the words on the paper. You're not allowed to give them any help to describe it, okay? any describing words about your level of capability. I just want you to think of the words that people would search for. So for example, if you're a project manager, you can say project manager, but you might also put in the word SAP or, or some other technology that's related to project management. trying to be nasty to you, they're not trying to say they don't understand, they're just trying to interpret the information they've seen. So be nice to them and uh, you know, hopefully they'll be able to explain what it is you do just by looking at those words. Just stand up and then somebody else will stand up and you can 
enjoying each other. It's a nice way to meet someone new too.
person used, or was there a lot more discussion required? I'll just wait to you, wrap up. Okay, folks, we'll wind that part up. I'd just like to get some feedback from the exercise. Excuse me, folks. If I can get you to just come back now. Okay, so in that exercise, was it difficult to just stay silent and let the other person talk, or were you really inclined to start a conversation? Was it, was it difficult to stay quiet, or did you want to talk? What, what would you say? You wanted to talk, didn't you? Like you had a process that was involved in, in generating a discussion. But what you've got to remember is in the online world, there's no discussion. So if you don't write those words, I'll never understand what you can offer, okay? So that's why it's so important. It's not just the words. You, you've got to be able to, just pick up the hand up. Uh, you've got to be able to use the words that people need to know to find you online. And if you don't incorporate that, those words in that discussion, I use the expression, if you don't tell, you can't sell. And you need to have the most important words at the beginning. So when I was working with oh, so hard. So us uh, at the Frontier, he has some really great words on his profile, but then you've also got to think about how do people perceive some of these words. So if you don't mind me using yours as an example, one of the words he had was radical thinker. Now the challenge that I have with radical is I associate that with, you know, people who want to start um, rallies and, you know, be a unionist or an advocate or something or another like that, which is not a, a good association if you're just looking for work. So then I just sort of asked him a few more questions about what his thinking really does and we found out that it was going to the root cause of the problem. And now using it as a root cause thinker, these are words that we understand, but are memorable. How many people on LinkedIn say that they're a root cause thinker? Nobody that I've ever seen. And so that makes you memorable. Because after a while, every LinkedIn profile, every resume, they all start looking exactly the same. You know, even though they're all different layouts. So if you use some words that are not familiar, that explain what you do, that's really fantastic. But the most important words, are the key words of the skills. Ironically, even though your attitude and your experience are going to be far more valuable than your technical skills in most jobs, most jobs are based on skills. So, you know, if you're looking for a job, then that's it. Do any of you here have side hustles, little businesses that you're operating on the side as well as doing uni at the moment? Anything? Nobody came to admit? <laughs> Are you okay to have a side hustle? Um, I, I have lots of different things that I do, as you can probably tell from that little list, and, and I love doing all of them, but I'm going to also discuss how you can use LinkedIn if you've got the side hustle as well. Because quite often, you know, you can do more than one thing. Uh, everybody assumes that, oh no, I just have to be a doctor and that's it. No, you know, there's all these other things that you can do, and you can get your LinkedIn profile to work for whichever one's your priority. So for instance, one guy, he had a photograph of him with a guitar on his, on his profile. So although he wasn't looking for guitar gigs, he got them simply because he had this picture of a guitar on his profile photo. So you know, you never know what sort of other opportunities can come as a result of telling your story on LinkedIn. So thank you for that. Um, now, in terms of networking, how many of you go to more than three networking events a month? just as I thought. More than one networking a month. Oh, that's good. At least you're getting out a little bit. I go between one and four events per week. And some terrible computer told me I've been working for 36 years, <laughs> which is terribly frightening. Um, so you will never stop learning. This is not the end of your learning journey. You will have to keep going out and go into things that will be helpful to you. So last night I ran an event called Living, Working and Networking in Melbourne. So for anybody who's new to Melbourne, they come along to this event, second Wednesday every month, we've been doing it for 14 years. And so I'm constantly meeting new people and I constantly get new ideas. 
and a lot of people struggle with networking. So please do not think you're alone in finding it challenging to start networking. So what I've done on page five is I've mentioned a few little tips. And one of the things that really helps is if you arrive early. Because if you arrive early, there's not gonna be many people there and it's much easier to walk into a room when there's only a few people than when there's a whole lot. And if there are a whole lot of people there, who do you head for? Which person would you go and talk to? Somebody who's on their own. Yeah, not with anybody else. Because they'll be so grateful to see you because they, they're too scared to talk to anybody else. So you just head straight for that person standing on their own. Hi, my name's Sue, how are you today? How did you find out about this event? <coughs> not, what car do you drive? Where do you live? How much money do you earn? Which religion are you? Yeah, what are you doing afterwards? Shall we grab a drink? None of these things are appropriate the first time you start talking to somebody. I also like the question, what keeps you busy during the day? Now this is important because if somebody's not working and you say, where do you work? How do you think they're gonna feel? Pretty awful. And it's much more interesting to find out what keeps people busy during the day. So I think that's a nice, safe question. As I said before, the weather and football, except not Collingwood. And also you need to stand a safe distance away. So if I can just ask you to stand up, and it's much nicer if I do this with a female than with a male. Now, if I stand this close to somebody I'm networking with, that person is gonna think I wanna have sex with them. <laughs> Please do not stand that close. I'm originally from Adelaide, and our comfortable distance is about here. If you're from New Delhi, you might be wanting to stand here. And I'm thinking, you know, so if you start networking with me and I start going away like this, you don't keep chasing me around the room, okay? You just let me have my nice little bit of distance. Now, if you come from a Latin country, you might want to kiss the lovely person you've just met. In Australia, we don't normally do that. So just, you know, if you go heading in and they go, <laughs> you know that they don't really want to kiss, okay? Now, when you shake hands, if you can just turn sideways for me and reach my hand. Oh, that's a good hand handshake, very good. Nice and firm, okay? If you give this a little wimpy shake, most Australians will think, what's wrong with them, you know? So you have to shake nice and firmly, not the Donald Trump style, more <laughs> passive, you know, oh, I'm terribly sorry, um, but a nice firm handshake is important. And if you are a touchy-feely person and you can't resist touching this lovely person you're talking to, the only space you can touch is between the elbow and the shoulder, nowhere else. Okay, so please don't start touching somebody inappropriately. And some people, because of their culture, will not feel comfortable with you shaking hands at all. So if you go to put your hand down and they don't return their hand, just put your hand back down again. Don't chase them around the room until you <laughs> shake your hand. Okay. The other thing is, it's very important to do eye contact, but not this the whole time, you know. Don't stop looking at me. You know, that's just too much, all right? But if, if you're always looking down, you know, you know it's not, not so comfortable, that's not going to be confident for you. Now, again, in some cultures, they do this. And apparently it's a sign of respect, but not in Australia, right? In Australia, it's like, well, what are you hiding? You know, so it's a different perception. So if you're accustomed and thinking, right, I'm going to show my respect, put my hands like this. And now that I've told you, you think, oh no, I've got to take that off. No, no. For goodness sake, just leave them crossed. I mean, I don't want to stop you from being yourself, but just remember, it's probably preferable if you can put your hands down. Also, if people clearly cannot understand you, you need to speak slower. And you need to say each word. So if they ask you to repeat something, don't say it faster and louder, because that's not going to help. Just say it slower, but at the same time. And likewise, if you don't understand something, ask them, can you please repeat that? Um, and also, there's something called universal language. And it's not sex, because you can't have sex with everyone. But you can smile with everyone. Everybody understands what a smile is. Thank you very much. Um, and, you know, even if you can't understand something but you smile, 
People will forgive a million mistakes if you're smiling. I, I tell you now. But too many people are so busy concentrating, I've got to do this right, and they don't smile. You know, and I met this lovely Brazilian man, he could hardly speak any English, but he smiled, I didn't care. You know, but he's worked something out. You know, use gestures or something, you know, you can you can get by. But if you're not smiling, people just can't be bothered and it will stop fairly, fairly quickly. Does anybody else have a tip they'd like to share? I know this is not typical university, you don't normally talk to one another, you normally just listen to us lecture you. But is there any other tips any of you have done when you're out networking you'd like to share with the group? Come on, be courageous. This is gonna happen in the real world. Maybe next time. Oh yes, that's um, one. This is gonna be interested in what the other person has to say. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So if, if you're if I'm talking away and I'm talking about Collingwood, then you can start asking me questions. Oh, are you a member of the football club? And how long have you been following them for? You know, and just keep asking the questions. And guess what? What will happen is they will eventually ask you a question. But if you just ask them questions, then you don't have to think what to say. So, you know, that can be a really good way to get the conversation going. Also, when you hear their name, if you can use it. But not, oh yes, Sue, that sounds very interesting, Sue. And what else do you know about Collingwood, Sue? And you know, what do you have for lunch today, Sue? Oh my goodness sake, stop calling me, Sue. You know, but if you use their name, they, they might remember you as well. Anything else? Yeah. Your attitude. Your attitude? Attitude, like it should be two way communication, like while you're yes. talking. Yeah, so not all one person talking and the other person listening. And, and yeah, making sure that it is two way and, and genuinely interested. There's some people who go to networking events and they look at the name tag, oh, you're not the CEO, I'm not chatting to you, I'm going to chat to somebody else. Now, you might be making a very big mistake because that could be the secretary you know, of the, the CEO or it could be the partner or it could be somebody else who knows somebody else. How many people do you think you should talk to at a networking event? More than 10. No. You know, I make a goal, no more than three. Right? Because if I say, oh, how are you? Yeah, oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> Who's going to remember me? Not one person is going to remember me. But if I talk to one person and I make an impact, they normally know 250 other people. So if I speak to three people, I've now met 750 people if I make an impression on those three people. What I'll also do is connect with them on LinkedIn so they never forget me. So if you haven't got the LinkedIn app on your phone, I'm going to invite you to put it on your phone now and sign in, because I'm going to get you all to connect with one another before you leave the room. So if you haven't got the LinkedIn app on your phone, please put it on while I keep talking. I could talk about networking for quite a while, but we've got other things to do, so we'll move on to page six. There are many ways that you can find networking events to attend. Now, obviously, as a student of Deakin, you can attend alumni events. And you might think, the last school exam, I'm out of there. I don't ever want to go back. What we've got to remember is, you're not going back for a lecture, you're going back to network. And these are other people who've also studied at Deakin. I'm an alumni of the University of South Australia, and they have great events and fabulous food. Why wouldn't you want to go? You know, it's great fun. Um, you can also go to the Careers Centre and get advice from the, the Careers team. So please don't underestimate you know, making an appointment, even if it's only for 20 minutes, and just going through and getting a few tips and advice. I also thoroughly encourage you to join the professional association related to your area of specialty. So my daughter studied a Bachelor of Animal and Veterinary Bioscience, so we looked up the Australian Veterinarians Association and we found out the student membership is free. Woohoo! And even like the Australian Human Resources Institute, something like $30 a year, why wouldn't you want to join as a student and have another 12 months at $30 rather than waiting until you graduate and then paying full price? It's much better to be a professional student member uh, before becoming a professional member and getting access to those benefits and opportunities. Professional associations quite often have mentoring programs as well that you can access free of charge. Again, why wouldn't you want to join the student association and develop a, a good relationship with a mentor? 
You can also find uh, the names of those different associations on the My Future website. You do have to register to get access to that information, but it is free. So you can find which associations you could consider joining. Um, you can also look on Eventbrite for details of events, and you can even sort by suburb. I host lots of events and promote lots of events that are in Camberwell. So if people want to know what's on in Camberwell, look up camberwellnetwork.com and see our newsletter. You'll see lots of events around here. The city of Whitehorse has a number of events even in this building. Um, so there's you know, lots of things even in the local area that you could go to. And these are really great practice for your networking. So until you're really serious about it, just go along for some of these really casual ones. Any events that have a speaker means that you get some education and then everybody's sort of warmed up and then by the end, the networking is a lot easier. Whereas if it's just mix and mingle with everybody, it's much harder to network because you've got not, not so many things to talk about. You can also look at Meetup and go along to things very professional or hobby or interest based. And if you start following particular things on Facebook, except not today because apparently it's crashed, um, you can you know, get more events. I'll, I'll recommend more events aligned with your interests. And your local council, your local library, and the state government. So we are very, very fortunate in Australia to have lots of resources provided by councils and libraries. So please feel free to go in there and ask them to find you some extra information. You know, lots of people think you can find everything on Google. Believe it or not, before Google, there were people. Yes, people have lots of information. Who, thought, who would have thought? And sometimes they can give you answers that you will never even think of if you went to Google. So please talk to some people. Uh, the Small Business Mentoring Service is based out in Ringwood. And what you can do is you can find a mentor and you can book one-on-one -on -one sessions and have your own private mentor as well. Sometimes depending on the council area you live in, if you're wanting to set up a business, the council will pay for the first session with a mentor as well. So these are really great ways to network and get started and, and meet different people. And if you subscribe to newsletters of these professional associations, even if you don't join as a member, you can then find out about events that are worth going to as well. So these are all ways to meet the, the decision makers and the people in your industries that you could actually network with. If you don't feel comfortable, take someone with you. Uh, but actually, I think it's better to go on your own because if you take someone with you, you end up talking to them instead of the new people. So it's actually easier to go on your own to something than it is to go with someone. But if, you, if you're very nervous, you know, take a friend. And also think about online events and webinars because quite often um, several organisations do online stuff as well as offline stuff. So you can get used to some of the people on the online environment um, before you meet them in person. And please just don't take your phone and just look at your phone, you know, to the whole networking event. What's the point of that? You know, you're there to meet people, so, so please do that. Also, in terms of the best ways to find work, um, up to 90% of jobs are never even advertised. And uh, networking for both real life and online is, is very effective, particularly if you don't have any experience, you know, in the workplace. Now, I used to be involved with the Westpac Graduate Recruitment Program, and when we assessed applicants for our graduate program from all disciplines, we would assess every application on multiple criteria. And grades or you know, results was only one of those criteria. We actually looked, have they had part-time jobs? Have they been involved in community groups? Have they held leadership positions? Have they been involved in sports? What sort of sports have they been involved in? And we would assess all of these variables before considering someone for the graduate program. So academic achievement was not the main criteria. So please, most employers, they want you to be able to come in and I call it work capable. Not just work ready, which means you turn up. Work capable means you can get there and you can provide some sort of value fairly quickly. So try and think about the types of things you can do to make yourself work capable. Some employers get very frustrated with people straight out of university because they think they've been taught all this stuff that's completely irrelevant. So you need to be able to demonstrate what you know and how that can be used. Well, you know, so you need to do some research and find out 
how the business operates so that you can say, look, you know, we did some project management stuff and we did, you know, group projects and we did this and, you know, I can definitely see how that would work in your organisation. People really appreciate that. Uh, referrals. So, with up to 90% of jobs not being advertised, a lot of people get the job because it wasn't advertised. And if it's not advertised, you're not competing with, I don't know, 100, 200, 300 other applicants. And so if you talk to Mary, and Mary says, go and speak to Ian, when you go and speak to Ian, the relationship you have with Ian is the same as the relationship Mary has with Ian. That's what a referral is. So when you go out looking and networking, your goal is not to say, can you give me a job? Can you give me a job? Can you give me a job to each person? It's to get a referral to somebody who might be able to introduce you to somebody who would be interested in hiring you. So that's the process, aim for the referral. Because if you go up to most Australians and say, hi, I'm Sue, can you give me a job? They'll say, no, <laughs> you know, because they don't know you. Why, why, why would they just give you a job? You know, there's no reason for them to do that. Do you say, look, I'm graduating soon and I'm really interested in working in the space of such and such. What tips and advice could you give me? Oh, yeah, well, you should speak to Ian. And voila, you've got a referral. Okay, so go out looking for information. Um, people find that much more palatable and are much more likely to give you some help. Um, you can also consider directly approaching people. So um, my son, when he was 13, he's underage and he didn't have a resume. And he used this old device called a telephone and he used it to call people and he just rang people until someone said yes. So he just found phone numbers and he rang them up because he wanted to work in an aged care facility playing games with old people. Don't ask me why, my son's quite unique. And um, so he, he would go, hi, my name's Peter, you know, it's one thing, blah, blah, blah. Oh, thanks for the call, Peter, but we're sorry, we can't do that. That's okay, have a nice day, bye. Then you hang up, and then you just get the next number and ring again. And here I'm thinking, oh, poor darling, oh, I'm so cruel. But he just rang until someone said yes. Now, you think about it, when was the last time your phone rang and it wasn't your mother? Nobody rings anymore. So if you do ring, you've actually got a chance. It's amazing. You just be persistent. And he also managed to get 15 job interviews in one week. My son left school before the end of year 10 when he was already 15. And he's never been unemployed for longer than three months. So it's not about academic ability. It's about the skills to find a job which are very different, and that's what we're trying to share today, okay? So it's about persistence. If you're not getting interviews, it means your application process is not working. If you are getting interviews and not getting the job, it means that you're not being able to prove that you're a fit for that organisation in whatever way that looks like. They'll give you an excuse. Oh, there was somebody else more qualified on this. Forget that. that those, those reasons mean absolutely nothing. You missed out, move on. Next. Just forget it, just keep going. There, loss, see ya. Let's try somewhere else. You can also consider maternity leave positions. So if your visa is an issue, somebody doesn't want you to take their job for the next five years if they're on maternity leave, do they? <laughs> Definitely not. They only want you to come in for nine months and disappear fast. So maternity leave positions, if you go looking for them, they could be a very good option for you because somebody doesn't want you necessarily to stay for a long period of time. Now, I'd also have a temporary position available or a contract position. And um, I have a friend who is just starting up a new Kickstarter program for a product he's designed. And he needed, because he's a little bit older than me, he needed to learn how to use Facebook. I hate Facebook, so I said, don't come to me, because you know I can work it out, but I don't want it. So he found someone on Airtasker, right? Now we all know that you get paid peanuts for a job on Airtasker, so we're not saying you're going to end up a multi-millionaire by getting gigs off Airtasker. But because this guy did such a good job and he helped my friend, and then I found somebody else who needed help with Facebook, guess who I referred to that gig? The guy from Airtasker. So you need to see these sorts of websites as opportunities 
to meet people, to network, to showcase and practice your skills. And I'm actually helping this guy out far more than I should because I've never um, marketed products online. I've always marketed services or information. So I've decided to take him on as a bit of a pro bono project, even though I've got plenty of other paying work, because I want to learn the skills. So don't just think, I've finished my MBA, I should earn money from day one. Well, here I am, 36 on in my career, and I'm still doing stuff for free to learn how to do more things so I can still get more work in the future. So we're gonna be constantly learning and that's what we have to do to survive, even if you have a normal job. The We Employ app, um, this is like Google for Jobs. So you have to go through a really rigorous process to get onto the We Employ app. So if you just do it for the exercise of understanding how online assessments work, that could be, be ready to lose at least three hours of your life. It's not fast, but it's a good exercise to help you understand. I did not do very well because I'm not a gamer and all these tests were gaming things. But I was so glad I did it because now I know what people are expected to do when they apply for these online types of roles. So again, you know, give these things a go. If you don't get a gig, who cares? You've learned something in the process. Um, there's others as well. Side Kicker, which is run by C, Found Careers. Um, I'm not exactly sure where that one came from. I found it recently. I think it's government jobs and higher up is for people with disabilities. So if you know someone who's got a dis disability, they can use higher up. So these tools can be used to help you network and, and meet other people and, and perhaps reach other opportunities you wouldn't otherwise do. Now, how many of you have registered yourname.com as a website? Any of you? No, why not? Oh yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, so you need to because you want to reserve that real estate before somebody else pinches it. And even if you don't publish anything for five years, when you do, it will be a five-year-old website and nobody else can pinch it in the meantime. So I definitely encourage you to register your own domain name because at some point in the future, I believe all of us are going to have to have our own website. The beauty of having our own website is we can put whatever we want on it. It's not limited by LinkedIn and the boxes. You can put whatever you like on your own website and you can start creating this beautiful archive of all the amazing work you've been doing, and you can have a record all on your own website. So suffice to say, both of my children have websites and I can update them, yeah. And if they ever want them back, they're gonna have to pay me a lot of money, because I own them. Also, you can start writing on Cora.com. So if you wanna be known as an expert in Python, and you're answering all these questions on Python, and I Google Python specialist, guess what? you probably come up because you've got content on Cora, you've got content on LinkedIn, you've got content on your website. Oh, this person's obviously a Python expert because there's content on all these other locations. So, free. If you start writing answers on Cora, they will eventually say, would you like to ask questions? And if you start asking questions and people look at them, they pay you for it. Now, you're not going to get rich on it, I'll tell you now, because lots of questions have already been asked on Cora, but these are all ways for you to increase your exposure, and not just in Australia, but internationally, because they can come up in international search results as well. Whilst you have a Deacon email address, I encourage you to join the conversation, because once you lose your Deacon email address, you won't be able to join the conversation. So if you want to be known for, for your writing, definitely join the conversation before you leave Deacon. Also make sure you add your Deacon email address to your LinkedIn account, because there will be people who know you on the Deacon email address and you want them to still come to that same LinkedIn account. You can also share content on Medium, which is uh, US based, and you can also share content on Open Forum if you meet their submission guidelines. So there's a lot of policy makers, government people who look at content on open forum. And don't think, oh, I'm too young and I don't have any experience. My, I've met plenty of pe young people who have amazing ideas and they should be published. And even when I look back at some of my old university assignments, even I'm surprised at what I wrote 20 years ago. 
So don't underestimate what you have to say. The only thing I would suggest is that you always stick to the positive angle, not the negative. So don't say the government's an idiot because blah. No, what can the government do to solve the problem? That's the better way to write the content. Uh, but so long as you, you're staying on the positive and being solution driven, go for it, as well as having a LinkedIn profile. Now some of you would be on social media and some of you have probably got pictures that shouldn't be on social media and seen by a future employer. So now is the time to remove those images from social media because I guarantee you every decision maker will look on Facebook, probably Snapchat now as well, and various other places, although you can't see it on Snapchat, can you, because it disappears. But anyway, they're going to look for your information online. And if they see something terrible, you won't get an interview. It's as simple as that. So time to clear that up. One person I met had been involved in the music industry and her reputation was so bad she had to change her name. So please, you know, time to clean up. You will be checked. You also want to show that you're not just a digital native or digital literate, you want to show your digital competency. So there's another university that I know of, which will remain nameless, it wasn't this one, who encouraged all of the social science students to have a LinkedIn profile. And they were very reluctant to even get a LinkedIn profile, but worse still, they didn't know how to use it. What a waste. And that's what you're here for today. You're here to learn how to use it. Um, so please, make the most of this opportunity. Um, you might also need to untag yourself. And as I said before, if you don't tell, you can't sell. So in terms of employability, most employers want experience and an adaptable attitude. And any experience, even if it's in the pizza shop, will be highly valued because it says that you know how to work with other people here. You need to be willing to learn on the job as well as ongoing, and you will need to work with many different personalities. And sometimes you might have to say to somebody, I don't like you saying that to me. And that can be really confronting when you're at the beginning of your career, but you need to be able to stand up for yourself. You may need to develop skills of assertiveness. I went on an assertiveness course, and there was this one person I really didn't like, and you know, she was always bossy. And this assertiveness skills course said all I had to do is rather get angry, is I just had to repeat the same sentence over and over. I prefer if you didn't say that. How about another one? I prefer if you didn't say that. And that's a skill. You know, I wouldn't have known how to do that unless I went to the assertiveness skills course. So think about these other skills that you might be able to, to use, even improving your pronunciation or your etiquette. And your pronunciation is very important in Australia. A lot of people find me quite easy to understand because I say each word separately. But also because I come from Adelaide, which we have apparently a nicer accent in Adelaide than we do in Melbourne. Um, but if you are not understood clearly in a business meeting, people will think you are stupid. It's as simple as that. You need to be able to be understood clearly, be able to speak clearly, and be able to project your voice. And also things like etiquette. There's, you know, two words that are very important. Please, thank you. It's amazing how often I do not hear these two words, but it's very nice to do it. How to use your cutlery. Do you know how to use cutlery? And holding a fork and knife, you know, the fork in the left hand and the knife in the right hand. And do you know which fork and knife to use when you're going out for these business functions? And do you hold the wine glass with the stem or just, you know, the cup? And, you know, what are the rules on these things? Do you know what they are, the etiquette of, of life? And also, if you're going to be competing against other uh, quality candidates, it's a lot easier to do if you, you know what you're competing against and you, you've prepared in advance. I also have an article published in the Daily Mail yesterday which talks about more resume tips and interview tips that you're welcome to check out via that link. And I presume uh, Dr. Menzies will get this, this email to you so that you... Yes, I've read it. Yes, excellent. Good, all right, so let's move on to LinkedIn. Um, oh, first of all, are there any other questions you'd like to ask me about what we've covered so far? I've covered everything perfectly. Yes, mm -hmm. oh, good, okay. All right, so LinkedIn, started out in the living room of co-founder Reid Hoffman in 2002, 
launched on the 5th of May 2003. I joined on the 21st of December 2003. So I'm one of the first 80,000 people in the world on LinkedIn, and I've been consulting on it since 2008. It's the world's largest professional network with nearly 600 million members in 200 countries, with over 10 million of those in Australia. Most of the people on LinkedIn earn more than $100,000 a year. So you're mixing with people who are generally well qualified or high earners. There are four and a half million active monthly users in Australia. And I've been, as um, Dr. Menzies said, to several universities. And one of them in particular had business students. And I asked them all to put up their hand, they were alumni. I said, how many of you have had job opportunities via LinkedIn? And nearly everyone in the room put their hand up. That's how important it is for people who have business qualifications. Their mission is to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. It's publicly held um, and they make money from lots of different things, so don't feel guilty about using the free option. I'm still using the free account. And they've also acquired additional services which they've integrated into the platform. So Pulse is the news feed, SlideShare is the, the PowerPoint presentation, and Linda is the online training. And then in one of the biggest acquisitions in corporate history, in 2016, they were acquired by Microsoft. So, you know, they're going to be around for a long time yet. And if you want more information, you can follow those links. So, as you saw from that first exercise, the very first step for you with your LinkedIn profile is thinking about your primary and secondary keywords. If you don't have those words, in your headline, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to be found. And I'll have to get you to sign in because your oh, computer's gone to sleep. And a few years ago, I was sue everything and I wouldn't get any business. And then I decided I obviously have to give myself a label so people can remember me. So I decided to call myself an independent because I am, I don't work for LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn specialist. So, uh, Dr. Menzies, can you please confirm that I've not touched this computer before? I don't know. Never touched this computer before, right? So, I'm going to do a Google search <laughs> and I'll prove, fingers crossed, <laughs> that if you Google LinkedIn specialist, I come up in search results. And yes, I do. Number one, page one in Google search results using my LinkedIn profile, and number three for my website. So this just goes to prove that if you use LinkedIn effectively, you too can be found for your area of expertise if you've decided on a label that you want to give yourself. Now, when you think about that label, it doesn't stop you from doing other things, right? So I don't just do LinkedIn. I also teach how to create a simple WordPress website, I do social media training, I do marketing, I do careers, I do all these other things. But the thing that I want the most work out of that I've decided to optimise online is the fact that I'm a LinkedIn specialist, okay? It even works interstate. So I've obviously produced enough content and I keep producing content that people click on that actually means that I stay in that spot. So you really need to think about your keywords. You also need to think about LinkedIn not just as an online resume, but as a resource that you can use for lots of other things. And one of those is building your network. As I said, you're all going to connect to one another a little bit later. But as you meet people throughout your career, you need to build your network. There is no such thing as job security. There was a job security when I've been retrenched, sacked, um, terminated, all sorts of things throughout my career and they won't be through yours either. We have to build a network. We have to have people who know what we do so that we can get referrals. There's also an article there on the business case for LinkedIn and some reasons why you should create a good LinkedIn profile. But, you know, but lots of us, if you Google us, um, will come up in Google search results. So let's see, should we do you, Dr. Menzies? Let's see. If and, and look, she's even known as being a deacon because, you know, Google says deacon afterwards. So maybe there's quite a few Jane Menzies. And her profile on the deacon website comes up first. And then your profile on LinkedIn is one, two, three, four. Now, that could go up to number one 
if she changes her URL to Jane Menzies. Because when you change your URL to just your name, it optimises your name in Google search results. So that's a tip for you and for everybody else, which we'll do shortly. It's also free, so that helps. And you can use it as your database to build and maintain your network. And you can also use it to find people. So as I said to you, um, I was looking on behalf of my client because he's got this new kitchen product. It's a spoon with a lid. And you know, you, you, you twist it off and you've got the spoon already attached to the lid so you can just scoop out what you want and put it back on. It's all part of one thing. So I get sucked into watching the living room on a Friday night and there's a little segment on the living room called Hot or Not. Right, so I thought, why don't we speak to the producer of the Hot or Not segment on the living room? So what did we do? We went to LinkedIn, we typed in the search box, the living room producer, and here is the person we contacted. We just found her on LinkedIn. As easy as that. So, you know, please, if you've decided you want to work somewhere, look for the people on LinkedIn and reach out to them. And, you know, you can find all sorts of things on there. You can even look at content. So when you click that search box and you click the magnifying glass, you get all these other variables. So if I just wanted to look up content on a particular topic, NBA Deacon, it will look through content on LinkedIn, which has Deacon and MBA in it. So you, you, you don't just have to look for people, you can look for content on here as well. And as you saw before, you can optimise it. Has anybody else got a LinkedIn story they'd like to share with the group? Not yet? Yes, brave person, number three. Um, so last week I published a story on LinkedIn. Well done. Um, yeah, so the story was basically what I did at the O Weekend at Deakin. Yes. Uh, so I shared all my experiences, tagged the relevant people, uh -huh. and put the uh, hashtags as well. Wonderful. And uh, put in a few pictures of how my week looked like and all the different activities I participated in. Yes. And then two days later, I had 10,000 plus views. <gasps> Uh, 30 plus people connected with me on LinkedIn and yeah, that was well like done. the highest. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. That's really fantastic news. I also worked with a school recently and the deputy principal did the same thing and she took a photo, they went on a school camp and took the photo from the back with the girls because you know you can't have their faces on and so on and she got an enormous number of views and that was the first one. Now when I looked at it, there were some other things I could suggest to her that she could have done to improve it. So there's a link in here about how to make a post go viral. So you've already indicated a number of things. You've, you've pinged people, you've put hashtags in, you've put pictures, they're all the things that can help. But what you can also do is you can put headings and you can make other things happen. So there's a particular article I wrote about tough love for the unemployed. Right now, I realise this is not number one search on on uh, Melbourne, you know, computers every day of the week. But anyway, this is just a particular piece I wrote, and number one, page one of Google search results for an article I wrote in 2017 is still there. And obviously, when people type that search query, they look at it. Now, it's another really interesting thing is the first article I wrote was tough love for the unemployed over 50. And then I got some feedback after writing that first article and somebody said, you should write one for the under 30s because they're the ones with a problem. You know, a typical person who's 50 says that the young ones have a problem. So I thought, all right, I'll write one for the under 30s. And then I obviously had to write one for the people between 30 and 50. But interestingly, the only one that's still up is the 30 year, under 30 year olds. So obviously lots of people under 30 are feeling that finding a job is hard and you know, people are looking for that. So you find out all these other interesting things as a result of doing that. And um, that's a, a great way to promote your experience and it's, it's a personal story which people love. And you know, how many people take photos of O-Week? You know, most people think, oh, what do I have to go for that for? I just want to get to the real stuff. But you know, you've probably inspired people to get involved um, with O-Week in the future. So well done.
Yeah. Any others? Okay, it's always much more interesting to hear from you than to hear from me, so that's why I like to incorporate um, your ideas. Um, you really need to know what your purpose is on LinkedIn, and as I said before, damn idea. All right. As a result of doing lots of presentations on LinkedIn, people bring up various issues and they say, I, I'm worried about my privacy. Well, you don't have to tell people what you had for breakfast. In fact, you would be ridiculed if you told people what you had for breakfast on LinkedIn. But what you can do if you become very nervous, is you can visit your own profile and on the top right hand side, you can scroll down and you can choose turn off your public profile visibility. So if something happens, and you decide to run naked around campus and somebody films it and all of a sudden all the journalists want to know who was the naked student at Deakin, you can say, right, I'd better disappear fast. So you just come in here and you just make yourself invisible and nobody will be able to look you up. It's instant, okay? So there's no reason to ever delete your LinkedIn profile. Um, you can just be anonymous. But this is also the spot where you can change it to just your name and that is absolutely critical that you do that. If your name is not available, you can put a dash between your first and last name. If that's not available, you can try putting a number, but you need to change it from whatever it is because that's just the default and it doesn't optimise your name. Um, you don't know who to connect to? Well, it depends on your purpose. I pretty much have a rule that anyone in Australia who doesn't look dodgy, I say yes to. But when they're international, I'm a little bit more selective. But you need to have your own rules on, on who you want to connect with. Um, if somebody becomes a problem, I remove them. So I'm not, I'm not worried about that. It doesn't send them a notification. Um, too much time, or you need to do a cost-benefit analysis. It may take a while to set up your profile, but after that, you shouldn't really need to do any more than a maximum of 20 minutes a week. So, and that's, you know, on, on the generous side. Um, too costly is to use the free account. Can't write. Well, you've got to remember a lot of people will look at your content on a mobile device. So please do not write six line paragraphs on LinkedIn. Nobody reads it. So just little short dot points are much better, particularly with lots of your keywords in them. Um, if you're scared of computers, bad luck, they do stay. And uh, business rules, well, you have your own social media guidelines or if you work for a company, they may have some guidelines. And if you want some help, ask a friend or expert or someone in the careers team here at the university. So. What we're going to do is we're going to, if you've got your profile on your laptop in front of you, we're going to do a little bit of a state of the nation and help you work out where you are now because all these numbers are real time only. So the first number we're going to look at is the number of people in your network. So we'll just click on my network from the top and what you'll see on the left is the number of connections that you have. So I've got 15,869. Can anyone beat that? Not today? All right, you can have up to 30,000 connections on LinkedIn. So if you can just write that number down, it's a real-time statistic, so you can just jot it down on your notes. The minimum I recommend is 60, and then the next goal to get to is 500 or more. The next number is your number of followers. So if you type in linkedin.com slash feed slash followers, you will see your number of followers, and you can see that I have 16,732 people following me. So I have more people following me than are connected to me. So in theory, that makes me a thought leader because I haven't connected with these people, but these people still want to see my content. So if you want to know how you're tracking, if people really love your work, you can compare the number of connections to the number of followers, and you can see what the difference is there. The next one on your own LinkedIn profile, so if you just click on the blue LinkedIn logo and then your face, is your number of views in the last 90 days. Now don't panic, because I saw somebody the other day who had zero in this spot, but I've got 876 people who've looked at my LinkedIn profile in the last 90 days. So obviously, if that many people are looking at me, I have a much greater chance of achieving the results I want. But just because I have that many people look at me, doesn't mean I'll get what I want if I don't tell the right story. 
So my story has changed many times because I used to get people who'd ask me all these terrible questions and expect me to do it for free. So I couldn't do it because I don't have time because you know I can't help 870 people every 90 days. So what I did at the beginning of my profile is I wrote my contact details, but the very next thing I say is my services. So they know they've got to pay for it if they're going to contact me. So that stopped me from getting all these unwanted inquiries. So now the people who ring me say, can I make an appointment? Which is exactly what I want. And if you're looking for a job, and you don't have your email address there, how do you expect someone to contact you? Like it's pretty obvious, if it's right there in front of them, there's no mistaking the how to reach you. If you don't want to put your phone number up, and you can see my phone number's written there in international format. So if they're on their mobile phone, they can just text me straight away or call me. So that number of views per 90 days needs to be at least 100 to verify that your profile is working for you. Has anybody got over 100 views in the last 90 days? Gold star, well done, excellent, congratulations. Now the next one on the right hand side is the number of times I've appeared in search results in the last seven days. This is only the last week. So even though I'm in all these searches, only 800 people have come to me in the last 90 days. So I'm, I'm happy if I'm in the search results and those numbers to be fairly similar is, is a good average to get. But for you, if you're just starting out, minimum of 50 search results in seven days. You can also see on that dashboard box where it says All Star on the right hand side. All that means is that I've filled in enough boxes. So if you haven't filled in enough boxes, you will not have an All Star profile. So you've got to just keep filling in bits until you get the All Star and you'll, you'll see a little um, sticker pop up on your screen. Now, further down, I've decided to use some skills and nice some, lots of nice people have voted for me on these skills. Now the top three are the ones that show. So I've decided to put my top three skills as LinkedIn, LinkedIn training and writing. And I encourage you for your top three skills to get at least 20 votes for each of those top three. So ask all your friends to vote for your, your top three skills. Now you can actually have up to 50 um, different skills that you want to be known for. So this is another reason why I appear in so many search results is because I've got you know all these extra skills listed in here and I've got quite a few votes for them. And uh, one stage LinkedIn lost all my votes because I had lots more but I've got you know nearly 200 votes for LinkedIn and how many? 124 for LinkedIn training. But you'll never see that. Once it gets over 99 it doesn't you know show any more numbers after that. But your initial goal is to try and get at least 20 votes for your top three. Also further down, you can get some recommendations and also give them. So the number of both received and given is fairly similar. And I suggest that you try and receive six recommendations and give six recommendations to somebody else. And be strategic. If you uh, recommend your lecturer, and your lecturer receives a call from the employer and the employer is looking for a very bright, fascinating student, guess who you might see on this lecturer's LinkedIn profile? Your details. So you can be quite proactive about who you would like to recommend. The only thing is, you can only say in a recommendation what you are prepared to say in court. So say for instance you work with somebody and they were a project manager and they made sure everything was done on time and on budget, but they were a pain in the neck and they were horrible to work with. You would not say they were a fantastic project manager. You would say they were on time and on budget. That's it. So please only say, you know, something accurate. And again, if you can use keywords in it. So Chris Spot's pretty smart because he's a LinkedIn photo photographer and he's given me a recommendation. So 875 people in the last 90 days have seen his details on the top of my LinkedIn profile which is pretty fr good free advertising. So again, think about how you can use these for your benefits. Now, on the top of page 10, you can have posts. So when you write a post, it just goes in the middle of the screen and it goes through the news feed. So these posts don't last very long and all I suggest that you, if you really want to be active on LinkedIn, 
you might do one post a week. You don't have to do six posts a day, you know. If you were, everybody would be sick of you, you know. What's he saying this time? <laughs> you know, here he is again. How do you shut up? Does he have a real job? You know, like, it's not, not a good look. So one a week is more than enough. So don't feel like you have to post and post and post. Um, one good one a week is plenty. And then also there, you can see that you can write an article. And if you want to do that, I'd suggest no more than, you know, three a year, or maybe one a month if you are really active. Um, you can see the articles I've written on my profile, just underneath here. Uh, the last one was about evaluations, but you can see all my articles by clicking on that. And there's various ones that I refer to in the notes here. So yeah, there you start for that. Now, the next thing that I'm gonna show you how to do is first of all, change the settings. I'm using Google Chrome, so we're going to settings and we scroll to the end and we choose advanced and then we scroll down to where it says downloads and ask where to save each file before downloading. And then what you can do on your own LinkedIn profile or anybody else's LinkedIn profile that you've seen, is you can click on this more box and you can choose save to PDF. So what this does is it saves a copy of the person's LinkedIn profile. So what you would do is you'd put today's date back to front, 0314, and then you put the name with dashes in between, and then LinkedIn dash profile, and you save a copy of your profile. Because in the unlikely event that LinkedIn blows up, you don't want to lose all your hard work typing away on this. But what you can also do is you can say, I found this amazing person's LinkedIn profile and I love what they've written. So I'm going to save it to PDF, print it out and borrow all those terrific keywords and put all those keywords on my LinkedIn profile. Why reinvent the wheel? You can just borrow something from somewhere else. But also, after you've made lots of changes, you would again come back in here and save your profile to PDF so that you've got a, an updated copy of, of your most current um, LinkedIn profile. And also what you can do from the me menu in settings, you can scroll down and you can request to download your data. Now you might remember last year with all that fuss over Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, people had to have access to their data. But the reason you want to do this is, again, in the unlikely event that LinkedIn blows up, I've got 15,000 connections. How would I ever remember all those people? But if I download my data and LinkedIn deletes my account because I was naughty or something terrible happened, I would still be able to have access to at least the names and the job titles of those 15,000 people. So you want to periodically request your archive and so that you have a backup of that as well. So now we'll go back into the profile and I'll show you the things that are on page 10. The first one I mentioned before, which was enter your public profile and URL, which was over here on the right hand side and you just change that to your profile. And then further down on that screen, you can make sure that your photo is visible to the public and all of your other sections are visible as well. So um, feel free to do that. Now believe it or not, one of the most important things on your LinkedIn profile is your photograph. And scarily, people will spend up to 60% of their time just looking at your photograph. So it could have nothing to do with the fact you've got an MBA, it could have everything to do with the fact they didn't like your photo. Now this particular photo took a week of skin preparation um, and then I went to the hairdresser and did a shopping job with my hair, but it took a professional photographer 70 snaps before we got that one. Now, I'm not saying you need to do all of that, but if you just take three shots on your phone and you, you just pick one and think that'll do, that's not enough. You need to do something a bit better than that. So, I've given you the details of Chris Watt again, um, he's in the profile booth in the CBD. It's about 40 bucks and you know, you can get your new photo done. But also what you can do is you can read that article on top tips for your photo, or you could submit your photo to the Photo Feeler website and people will vote for you, you vote for them. And they, they will decide whether you are competent, likeable and influential. 
So it's mostly American, so you have to decide whether you value their opinion or not. Um, but you know, it's another way to get some feedback on your photograph. But a couple of things I would encourage you to do is to be looking at the camera and smiling with your teeth showing. And for all of you, male or female, I recommend that you wear garments with a high neck. And the reason you wear a high neck is it frames the face and puts the focus on the eyes. Because in Australia we do business with the eyes, not with the boobs or the chest hair, okay? Which tends to show up if you've got, you know, an open neck. So please wear high neck garments so that it frames your face. Also, please don't wear bright green earrings or something that just looks terrible in the whole photo because then they'll be looking at the bright green earrings instead of, again, looking at your eyes. So you don't want something distracting, you know, in the background either. So if you're wearing coloured clothing, you can have a white background. But if you're wearing white clothing, you're probably going to need a dark background so that there's a contrast. So we're just going to blend in to the whole thing. But make sure you feel good on the day. And if you normally wear glasses, you know, have your photo with glasses on, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, and try and get your eyes on the one third line. I've seen some photos where there's all this space above the head and it looks like the person's short and stupid. You know, it doesn't look good. So try and get your head towards the top of the circle. And when you, you try and edit it, you'll see that there's a one third line and you try and get your eyes, you know, on the, on this one third line. So ideally it would be better if, if my head was, you know, my eyes were there instead. Um, but my photo doesn't sort of allow for that, so yeah. But there's some tips. Now, I've got a very corporate looking photograph. If you want to be a creative and you want to have something a bit more interesting, that's perfectly fine. You've just got to think of it being, if you're going to work with these particular people, would they feel comfortable seeing you in that type of clothing. Um, yeah, and the guy with the hairy chest, I told him to Photoshop the hairs out because, you know, <laughs> it just didn't look appropriate. Um, and as I said, I, I don't think it's, I think it's really good to have high neck arms so it frames the face. That's, that's another really important thing. Okay, uh, the headline. So, you might notice there that I've got more than 120 characters. I've got four lines. And that's a little LinkedIn hack. If you update your headline on an iPhone, not on an Android phone, on an iPhone, you can get 200 characters in your um, little headline there. And you'll also notice I'm really hip and cool because I've got an emoji dancing lady on there, so I look really cool. But I didn't put too many emojis on there because then I look like a try-hard 53-year-old, so um, I haven't got the one on the end. So try and make it, you know, a little bit of personality in here. Because if you just said, I'm a Python guy, you know, and all this other language, that's terribly boring. But if you say that you've got some other interest, all of a sudden, oh, where's that Python guy who also likes, what else do you like? Outside of boring stuff? <laughs> you like something else? Cycling. Cycling, yeah. So you can have cycling and a picture of a little bike on there. I was like, where's that Python guy who's a cyclist? And it will make you more memorable. Okay? so. I, a lot of people have travel, so I put a little aeroplane on there. Um, somebody who's into tennis, I put a tennis ball on there. It just makes it a bit more interesting. And there's only one character, so it's, you know, it doesn't use up too much. It even shows up in Google search results, so it makes it stand out in search results. And also, you've got to choose an activity that's appropriate. So a Python guy who likes cycling is pretty good. But one of my clients was an accountant, and he liked playing poker. Anybody here want to have an accountant who plays poker? Not me, you know, because he'd be paying poker with my money, wouldn't he? So, you know, that's not a good hobby to list if you're an accountant, okay? So try and make it something relevant. Uh, when I work with older people, I say, make sure it's an active hobby. You know, if I said I was into gardening, you'd probably think I'm a grandma, you know? I don't want to be seen to be a grandma. So I put the dancing on. And I do, I go dancing, two hours, sweaty, everything, barefoot, I'm crazy. Um, so yeah, make, make it interesting and make it a little bit more personal. But the first part of that headline is still the most important because that's what's going to show up in the news feed. So the first few words are the most important. That's what people are going to remember about you and what you want to be known for. Now, the background picture is that image behind my face. And you can see I've put my books up on the top right hand side. 
And you might think, well, so why didn't you put them in the middle? Anybody got any reasons why they put them in the middle? Correct. Well done. On the phone, my face moves into the middle of the screen, so it would block out the picture of the books. So that's why I put the books on the right hand side. So for the rest of you, you can just put the colour, so you can put white or LinkedIn blue. It still looks better than having the, the, the blue icky one with just the lines and the stars, and which is the default. Um, another person I know, uh, we put in the colour that was in her photograph. So that matches, see? So it just looks nice and clean and a bit different to every other LinkedIn profile without being distracting. And what that does is it also drags the eye to the face because it's not being distracted by any other fancy, beautiful picture of buildings or scenery or something other else like that. So people look at the scenery instead of the face. Whereas if it's just a solid colour, it just uh, looks straight away at that. Okay, so that's the background picture. Now, in summary, I've already mentioned a couple of things here. So I've got my contact details. So even though my contact information is in over here, people have to click to get that information. So if I put my information here, then people can see it straight away. And you can see I've also added in some videos and a picture. And then if they click see more, I've just written these easy to see dot points and then a bit of a bio down the bottom. So the way you write your summary will depend on your purpose and on the bottom of page 10 there's a little link which can explain some tips on how to write your own summary for what you're trying to achieve. Now, as I said earlier, I also mentioned about you adding your email address to your LinkedIn account. So to do that, you'll go to settings and make sure you add in your Deacon email address as well as any other email addresses. And every job you have in the future, add all those email addresses to your account as well. Don't take any of them off, because people will know you via that email and you want them to come to this profile, not accidentally start up a new one. Now, if you add in your phone number to LinkedIn, you could have a problem. One of my clients, She's a lovely woman in her 30s, and she's been on lots of first dates. So all those first dates were put in her phone, and then what she did, she put her phone number in here, and then she allowed LinkedIn to look through her phone contacts and invite all of the people in her phone contacts to connect with her on LinkedIn. And she didn't realise that that's what she had done. And what it's called is syncing, S-Y-N-C. So if you add your phone number in here, that's all well and good for security reasons, but it's terrible if you don't want, if you forget not to say no when LinkedIn asks you six million times, would you like me to go through your phone and see who else you know on LinkedIn? So I'm just warning you, if you put your phone number in there, you've got to be careful not to sync LinkedIn with um, your phone. Also on this screen is the autoplay video. So if you're out on your mobile phone a lot and you don't want to use up all your data, you just turn off autoplay videos. What we'll also look at in the privacy section is who can see your email address. And whilst you're looking for work, I suggest anyone on LinkedIn should be able to see your email address. And you don't necessarily want people to download it and spam you, so you can choose no for the other one. Also, with who can see your connections, I recommend that you leave that to your connections as well, so people know who you're connected to. But this next one, viewers of this profile also viewed, I definitely encourage you to choose no for that one, because you don't want somebody to get to the end of your profile and say, oh, people who looked at Sue also looked at all these other people, and then they go and visit those profiles instead. So the only time you turn this on is late at night when you want to do a little bit of espionage and you want to find out who your competitors are, you turn it on, quickly look at your profile, oh no, they're my competitors, you can go back in and turn it off. Okay? So that's the only time you need to turn that one off. Now, you might have a job interview tomorrow and you might want to check out who the person is 
And you might say, I want to look at their LinkedIn profile and I don't want them to know that I've looked at their LinkedIn profile. So what you can do is you can make yourself anonymous and then look at their LinkedIn profile and they'll never know that you looked at them, even if they have a premium account. And then you come back in here and turn yourself back on. Now you need to leave yourself turned on all the time because that means that you can see who looked at you. If you don't have it turned on, you won't be able to see who looked at you. Now the benefit of leaving it turned on is if you look at someone, there is a 30% chance they will look at you. So if you start looking at potential employers and then they see that you keep looking at their profile, they might say, who is this student from Deakin University who is looking at my profile and check you out? So why wouldn't you want to leave yourself turned on when you go checking out other people's profiles? But as I said, sometimes it's necessary to be anonymous. So even if they're premium, they won't be able to see that you've done that. The other thing is I turn off share job changes because if you're updating your LinkedIn profile, people don't really need to know that you've changed your job. It's just a waste of um, space, so the people are turned off. Okay, now back to your main profile. in this contact info. Now what you can do is you can add in three websites in here. So whilst you're a student at Deakin, I suggest you add in Deakin University because it's a pretty good brand and it's pretty nice to have an association with it. You can even link to the Deakin University MBA I page on the website so that people know this is the course you are studying. So you would add in websites and when you add it in, you would add in the link which you copied and pasted. Oops, LinkedIn's gone funky. You can try again. And then you choose other, and then you can write a 30 character description Deacon MBAI program. And you can write a little description rather just have the link. So you can add three websites in there. So if you become a member of a professional body, you can put that in there. And if you've got your own website, yourname.com. You put that in there as well, and then people can find your other information. Um, you can also add in your instant messaging programs. This place for your phone number is much safer. You can put your address in, but please do not put your date of birth on anything that you don't have to, because that's part of your identity. And I'm an ex-banker, and you don't want to give away your identity because people can get access to your bank account if they have this sort of information. So yeah, don't, don't put that on there. Any questions? Oh, I'm still perfect, am I? That's pretty good. I'll keep going. All right, experience. Now, the way you write your experience up is important. And one of the most important things is having what's called a current job. So you might think that I'm only studying, well that could still be your current job. Because if you don't have a current job, you get put in the bottom pile of applicants. Because it says, well you're not working, so therefore you're not a good candidate. So, you know, anything can more or less go in the top, describing what you're doing. So you can say studying and working part time and such and such, whatever, from X day until now. So that you do have a current job. Or even if you're just studying, just saying that that's what you're doing. But you can see here in my job title, I haven't just said I'm a founder or director of my consulting business. I've actually put in my key words in the headline for my job. So even if you're just an intern, you might say intern dash Python, you know, all the programs you're using because it helps the stupid computer say, this is what this person is an expert in. So if you do a search for somebody that has Python, it will say Python in the headline, and it'll probably say Python in the current job. So that's why these keywords are so important. So you'll see all of my jobs, nearly every one of them, will have either the word LinkedIn or trainer, because I want to be known for those keywords. So that's why I put them in, in all those different spots. The other thing that I encourage you to do is write in 
your experience section any achievements you had. And you might think, well, I'm only starting out in my career and there's not many achievements. But if you were selected for something, you were invited to do something, you were seconded somewhere else, you know, you were chosen to represent the business at the expo, they're all achievements because when you came in, you were there to do a job. But then when you got the job, they asked you to do these extra things. So they're all achievements. What we're taught in recruitment is past behaviour is a predictor of future performance. So if you were achieving those results previously, we assume that you would be able to do the same sorts of things again in the future. That's why you need to talk about them and talk about the most important ones first. And my purpose is obviously to get clients, so I've, I've written mine slightly differently. But if you look further down, you will see um, different roles that I've got. So for my teaching at the CAE, I've written it differently. So you can see here it says achievements and then tasks and there's the courses that I run and then I provide contact details and a description and even my email address there. So people can verify that I do actually work there and you know it tells the story and there's all that information there. So you can stalk me after today as often as you like. If you keep looking at my profile, I'll be saying yes, they're committed to their updating their LinkedIn profile and I'll be super excited. I won't assume you're gonna be outside my door and knocking on it, you know, no. I'll just say, well done, you're doing your homework, which is really fantastic. It also includes a bit more of a description up the top of page 12. Now, education is obviously very important to you and it is also very important to me. So, I went to the University of South Australia, which most people here probably have never heard of it. So, what I've done is I've included a very brief description of the university and then I've also included all of my subjects, which, guess what? More key words. Now, one of those subjects is one called Business Ethics. Now, if I wanted to be on boards, what I would have to be familiar with is governance, risk and compliance. They're three big words in board management, executive director, you know, roles. Now, obviously, that's not one of my subject titles, but in the subject business ethics, we did talk about governance, risk and compliance. So what I could do is I could write topics included governance, risk and compliance. And because it's a stupid computer, it doesn't realise it was only a topic and not a subject, and I will come up in search results. So this is how the dating websites work. When I was on the dating website, I said I'm not interested in anyone who likes horse racing or gambling. So guess what? All these profiles of horse racing and gambling people came to me because it didn't see the word not. Okay, it just saw the word horse racing and gambling. So I thought they were my interests. So likewise, you need to think about what words from your subjects would be helpful to your future career that you could include in here. But you must not lie. If you didn't do governance, risk and compliance, you can't just add them in and say they were topics because they weren't. So please do not lie. You will be found out. We had a, um, an applicant at Westpac who did lie on his resume and he was immediately dismissed because he lied. And then we found out he got a job at National Australia Bank because we knew the people at the NAB, we told him. So he got sacked from there. So people find out, I'm telling you now, don't lie. Um, massage the truth, perfectly okay. And play the algorithms game, definitely. Okay? Even deciding on the order you put them in, I just decided alphabetical. But also, this tells a little bit of a story about me, because I specifically chose that. I was a mature age student, and I started that when I was 26. So you'll see that I've got a broad range of subjects, which is exactly what I want to tell people anyway. So it tells more of a story. And also, do you believe I've got the degree, or did I just make all that up? It's a bit harder to believe I made it up if I wrote it down. So again, it goes to show that I'm thorough and detailed and, and so on and so forth. So definitely put in your education. Now, uh, another person I know did three subjects at Monash and then did the rest of their degree at Latrobe. 
and they weren't going to put the three subjects they did at Monash on their LinkedIn profile. Silly mistake. Because if you don't, then you don't end up on the Monash alumni list. So if you've done some study somewhere else, even if you didn't finish it, just write down subjects completed and put it on because then you'll appear in the alumni of that other institution as well. So now they're on, this person's on the alumni of Monash and Petro, and there's no gap on the resume either. So it's definitely worth doing even if you've only done a couple of subjects. Okay, um, there's other sections, volunteer experience. Voluntary work is highly uh, valued in Australia. I have had some of my best experiences being a volunteer. One of them was taking kids scouts out sailing on Sydney Harbour for two weeks as part of the Scouts Jamboree, which is not an opportunity I would have professionally. So, you know, do voluntary work. It's a lot of fun, particularly if you do it. Now, I've chosen to put in my RE one first. You can use this little hamburger to shuffle the order. But if you go through, you'll see some of my other voluntary roles I've put in here as well with lots of keywords, etc., etc. But, you know, the sausage cooking stuff, I sort of put a bit further down because it's not as relevant to my career. But, you know, definitely encourage you to consider voluntary work and your endorsements, recommendations. And then there's lots of other sections you can do. So I'm sure some of you here can speak other languages. I speak a very small amount of bad French. So there it is, it's, it's on there, that I have French as well. So please, you know, put all your languages in. Why not? Um, projects you've done at uni are really good to write up. Um, if any of you've got patents, you know, put it all in. The more of these boxes that you're filling, the better it is. And you can also showcase your professional membership. So, none of you said you had side hustles, but if you did, you could create a company page, which you have to find from the work menu. It says over here, create a company page. Why they put it there, I don't know, but anyway, that's where you do it. And then once you've got a company page, it's under here, under your profile, and then you'll see your companies that you've got. Um, I've given instructions on how to maximise it, and if you're an employee, how you can support your employer. I regularly like um, content provided by people who've employed me. Um, I've taken a couple of photos before you came into the room, so I'll share that I was at Deakin today, and you know, put that through my LinkedIn profile. Why wouldn't I say? that I've been to these places and, and I've had work. It's fantastic looking at it. Uh, just as you did for O Week. Wherever that girl's from. Oh, yes, you've moved, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so definitely. Now groups, um, as I mentioned on page 13, they keep trying to revitalise groups on LinkedIn and to be honest, I find them a waste of time. So you can pursue it if you wish, um, but make sure you go to a good group. Uh, but I don't bother about them anymore. Now, as you're looking for jobs, you need to click on the Jobs tab and you need to update your career interests. So any large employer or recruiter will have a service called LinkedIn Recruiter, which costs them about $15,000 to $20,000 a year to have. And it means that they can look at this information on your LinkedIn profile. So if you haven't filled this in and they find your LinkedIn profile, they're gonna say this person's not really serious about getting a job. So you definitely wanna fill this in. And it only stays current for three months. So you need to write in a little description. And I just said, I'm casually looking for these sorts of roles. I'm happy to work remotely or in Melbourne and full-time contract, part-time, temporary. But if you say, look, I'm happy to work anywhere in Asia and I'm gonna put Singapore, Hong Kong, Indonesia, you know, blah, blah, blah. You can just add in all the countries and you can optimize your LinkedIn profile for all these other destinations. And so some of my clients who are moving to Melbourne, I actually tell them to change their address to Melbourne before they get here so that they appear in Melbourne search results. So if you decide you want to get up here in London, change yourself to London now so you appear in London search results and tell it down the bottom that you're, in, you know, you're interested in London. And then up the top, where it says, let recruiters know you're open, say currently based in Melbourne, but moving to London in June. Ding, ding, you're all done. So you're not lying, but you're optimising your opportunity to be found in those London search results. Um, you can also turn on job alerts. So if you start looking for jobs, 
So yeah, I'm going to go for the python again and we say Melbourne. And it brings up jobs. Then what you can do is you can save that job alert and it will, you know, keep you notified when more python jobs come up. If you follow the target companies and they also have LinkedIn recruiter, you're much more likely to appear in their search results. And I know for a fact that National Australia Bank does this. So if you want to work at the National Australia Bank, you follow them and then you've got a much greater chance of appearing in their search results. And you can also reach out directly to people, as I showed you before, when we were looking at that producer in the living room. Um, if you're currently unemployed or studying full time, as I said before, make sure you've got that um, current position filled in. And please do not mention years of experience. Now, there are some professions where you're required to have a certain number of years of experience. So, for instance, a lawyer, after graduations, they, they mention that you have to have had so many years of lawyering experience. But everything else, your number of years of experience will either be too few or too many, which is really irritating. So don't mention it. They can work it out by looking at the rest of your LinkedIn profile. So please leave years of experience off. I remember when I was 20 and I thought anybody over the age of 30 was ancient. So I guess you probably think pretty similar to how I used to think when I was 20. Now I'm 53, anybody over 90 is ancient. Um, so, you know, our perspective changes over time. But what you don't want is people making assumptions. So you don't want there to be any reason why they wouldn't make the inquiry. Um, also talk about your achievements in a language that is appropriate for the location. So in America you can say, I'm the greatest person who graduated from Deakin ever because I won the blah blah blah. And I say, wow, I'm going to have that person. And if you say that in Melbourne, they're going to think you're an idiot. So please use the right language. Don't be afraid to showcase what you have done. Yes, I achieved top marks in XYZ exam uh, for 2019. That's an achievement. Put it in. You know, be proud of it. There's also a terrible tendency, particularly for women, who think that if they can't do a job at 99%, they can't do it. And the typical average, and please, I'm not trying to be sexist or racist or anything here when I say this, um, for males, it's <coughs> around about 60% competency. So forget whether you're competent or not. If you've got, you know, some experience, put it in. That's, and then work out how to do the rest later. I truly believe, even if you have all the skills, you walk into a job tomorrow, it will be six months before you're competent at it, even if you have all the skills. It takes that long before everything becomes automatic. So give things a go. If you've got some experience, put it in. Um, and if you optimise your LinkedIn profile, you can appear in search results too for your, your keywords. Now, I reduce this amount of content in the notes from what I normally provide, because I thought you're all gonna go crazy if I go into all this information about content as well. So if you've decided you wanna write content, there's a link to talk about how to come up with those ideas, and then how to make posts go viral, and how to make articles go viral. So I'm not gonna discuss that. If you wanna come up and ask me more about it, I'm more than happy to do that, but I really wanted to focus today on the job search piece and you know making sure you optimize your profile just so that you can be found. Also, if you start doing lots of searches, you might run out of the opportunity to do more. So what you can do is you can do what's called a Google advanced search. And then you can look for the words that you want. I don't know, living well no. Um, Let's say international HR expert, and then we say anywhere on LinkedIn down here. And we can do as many of these searches as we want, and Google will just give us all the answers. So that's another way to find you know different people if you want to um, without running out of searches on LinkedIn. Um, a lot of social media trainers will tell you that video is very important. 
And I had this lovely female psychologist who told me that men love video because they can't read. Just remember she said that, not me. But the reality is, for me, I don't put a lot of video online. And the reason I don't is because I'm fussy about the content I like and I want it instantly. And if I see a picture and can read the text, I'm done. Whereas a video, I have to press play and wait for a minute or three minutes or something or another else. So for me, video is not my preferred form of content. But there's other LinkedIn trainers who put loads of video up. Um, and, you know, there's always something there. I think this lady does it a bit. And for her audience, oh, this, this is the one. She's the side hustle girl. And um, she's always putting videos up. Here we go. Have we got sound? Some time since I've made a LinkedIn video because I've actually been sick, which is so unlike me. I very, very rare. Now, this is not what I would put online. Now, I'm not criticising it. It's perfect for her audience. So you have to think about whether video is your tool or not. But I've decided I will put videos up occasionally. So when I was at Macquarie University, I took a little video, it was sticking off day and the cicadas were buzzing. I thought, here I am, and you know, here's the sign. And, and that was it, and it was like 30 seconds. And that was it, I was done. So I did it because I've got a video because everybody says I should have a video on LinkedIn, but I don't put a whole lot of video on. And the other problem I've got is if I put video on and it keeps appearing in people's news feeds, people say, oh, there's silly again, there's silly again, you know? And I think, well, Sue, shut up, please, because I've seen her enough already, and I don't want that impression to be given. So it's not my favourite thing to do, but I do put video on occasionally. But you can see with this video, it's just, you know, shot with a laptop from below. I don't recommend that. If you're gonna have a video taken, Film it from above your face. Everybody looks much better from up here than from down here, even if you're 20, right? So take your photo from up here. And also take it landscape, not portrait. Because if you take portrait, there'll be those black lines either side, which is really distracting. So take it landscape. And then if it's an important video, put it on YouTube, because it will stay on YouTube and you'll get value out of it today tomorrow, next week, next month, whatever. And when you put it on YouTube, you can make sure it has closed captions and you can tidy up the captions, you can download that SRT file. Then when you upload it into LinkedIn, the video and the SRT file, there'll be captions along the bottom of the video. And can anybody watch a video that's got captions without reading them? Like, I don't know, I think it's a physical impossibility. So it reminds people to really absorb your content. So if you're gonna to go to that kind of trouble, putting the captions on the video will really make it worthwhile. So that's the easiest way to do it. Put it on YouTube first, get the captions, and then uh, upload it when you upload it to LinkedIn. And as you'll see in the notes there, it says native video, which means you uploaded it directly into LinkedIn, will automatically play on mobile and desktop and is five times more likely than all types of content and start a conversation amongst vendors. So, you know, if it's a, if it's a really good piece of information, yeah, definitely put it on, on LinkedIn. But um, I've shown a few people some of Ruby's content and, you know, I think what she's doing is amazing, but it's not for my audience, but it's definitely for her audience. So, you know, you've got to think about who's your audience and it works for her. She's got international speaking gigs, she's got heaps of people signed up for a program. You know, it really does work. So I'm definitely not criticising it, but you've got to work out which, which sort of angle you want to do if you're going to put videos in. Now, saying thank you. I said earlier about please and thank you as being really, really important. And I think it's a really good strategy to write reviews. Now, I just started writing reviews on Google because I thought it was nice to say thank you. And then I started realising that I was getting points and Google decided to make me a Google local guide. Ooh, how exciting. And now I've got more points, I'm a star Google local guide. And now I've got an invitation to go to the Google local guides conference if I write, if I do a one minute video and it wins and they'll fly me to San Francisco for a week to meet all these other Google local guides and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, how exciting is that? So I'm gonna give it a bash, why not? But 
you can be very strategic about who you write reviews for. So believe it or not, my reviews, particularly if you take a photograph, get heaps of views. So one of them was for the Governance Institute. I just went there for a lunchtime seminar. So that's the photo I took before I went in, and now it's on Google. And if you click the reviews, there's only one review there, five stars, and there's all my details. So everybody who checks out the Governance Institute gets to see my review. Like what's not to like about these opportunities to, to get your name out there. So rather than just writing a review when you're angry, <laughs> I encourage you to start writing reviews when you're happy. And today I'd say Deacon's done a pretty good job, so why don't you say thank you to Deacon for giving you this opportunity? Because not every university does it, and not for this length of time. And not every university gives you all the prep and, and everything else as well. So if you write a review for me, I say thank you by sending a digital copy of the book. By the way, these books are in the Deacon Library. I've already given them to the library previously. So if you want to borrow it from the library, you can do that as well. Um, there are instructions on how to use LinkedIn. And some of you might be really clever computer programmers and think you can automate this. Nope. It's against the LinkedIn user agreement. And if you do that, you have run the risk of your profile being deleted without warning. So please look at the user agreement and check the do's and don'ts if you think, you know, you probably shouldn't be doing it, you probably shouldn't. And also there's a great website called archive.org slash web. So if you write a really good article on LinkedIn and you're worried it might disappear, you can copy the link and put it in archive.org and it will stay there forever. Even if, you know, your other stuff's deleted. And obviously I encourage you to follow Deacon University online. So now what I'd like you to do is write down what's been most helpful to you. This is purely for your own benefit. This has got nothing to do with me or Deacon. Think about what's been most helpful to you today and what you'll do next. And then if you feel comfortable, you can share it with the person next to you. Just give you a minute to do that. just on the bottom of the handout is what to do before you speak to website design. So if you're thinking about creating your own website, yourname.com, there's a few little instructions in there because lots of people have lost lots of money and made big mistakes uh, trying to create their own website. So I've, I've provided some tips in there. Also how much you should pay for it if you're not going to do it yourself and also what you would do when you're upgrading or redesigning your website as well because one of my clients um, had her website updated and lost nearly all of her traffic overnight. It was very scary. So, um, yeah, there's a few extra tips on that. All right, so the next thing I want you to do is um, turn on Bluetooth on your phone and um, go to the LinkedIn app. 